Um, welcome to uh, Chief Cornerstone, and we're glad that you're here, and, and uh, I assume that all of y'all are the people that can't afford to go on fall breaks to Florida, so we're going to all meet together tonight instead of riding out a hurricane together somewhere, and um, I've heard that afterwards Andy's sponsoring a key lime pie social <laughs> next door um, for everybody, so we can get a little taste of Florida, but I don't know about that. We'll have to take it up with him, but um, thank you all for being here tonight, and and um, tonight I, I've uh, got a message that uh, has been on my heart for a little while, and, and um, I kind of went back and forth on which scripture to, um, to dive into tonight, and, and I, I, feel, I feel like God has led us to John chapter 15. Um, we're going to pick up in verse 9 tonight, but before we do that, I, I kind of want to tell you a little bit about what we're going to talk about tonight, because we can't talk about everything that's in that passage because um, Brother Keith told us we had to be out of here by 8 o'clock. So. Um, but what we're going to talk about tonight is the most important thing, and that is love. Amen. All right? Love. And um, that's something that our world has, has uh, manipulated today. It's a, it's a word that today um, the world uses in a way um, almost to the extent that they use the rainbow today. We all can see that. That's a visual presence that they use the rainbow to represent something that's negative, represent something that's ungodly, to represent sin. And they use the word love in the same way today, um, a lot of ways. And, and the, what the world says about love is that I will love you if. I will love you if you can um, do something for me. I will love you if you don't cause me any problems. I will love you if you agree with me. I will love you if you can make me money or if you can give me things. Or I will love you if. I will love you if you tell me that my sin is not sin. I will love you if. That's what the world says about love. And that's not love, folks. A love that, that has an if afterwards is not love. All right, But that's the way the world sees love. God sees love a little different. Um, he tells us about it over in, uh, Paul tells us about it over in 1 Corinthians, all right, over in 1 Corinthians, and I'm going to read this first. In 1 Corinthians in chapter 13, Paul tells us a lot about love. We read this at weddings and things all the time, but this is not for weddings. This is for everyday life. Paul says that love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It's not boastful. It's not arrogant. Love is not rude or self-seeking. It's not irritable. It does not keep a record of wrongs. I don't know if y'all have watched the news lately, but the world's love keeps a record of wrongs. All right? Love find no, finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. And that's what God says about love. So we're going to talk about that kind of love tonight, and, and the, Bible, um, the Bible has some different types of love that it talks about. The type of love that we're going to talk about today is found in the book of John. If you'll turn with me to the book of John in chapter 15, and it is the ultimate type of love. It's called agape love, agape love, and that's, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. All right, that's the type of love that only comes from God. It only comes from God. So let's, let's pick up and read with me in, in verse 9. As the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have, keep the, I have kept my Father's commands. Now this is Jesus talking. We have to remember that. This is Jesus talking in the upper room. All right, he's, our, he's, uh, he's uh, already washed his disciples' feet over a chapter ago. All right, so... Um, but they haven't gone out to the garden yet. So this is Jesus talking to his disciples. I have told you, in verse 11, I have told you these things so that, you're, so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. This is my command. You love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this than to lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants anymore. Because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to produce fruit so that your fruit would remain. So that whatever you ask of the father in my name will be given to you. This is what I command, that you love one another. Let's pray. 
Father God, we just thank you for tonight, Lord. Uh, we just thank you for all of your many blessings, God. And, and uh, Father, I want to thank you for the opportunity to preach your word tonight, Lord. And, and uh, God, but I just pray that you'll just move me out of the way, Lord. God, take away any fleshly thoughts in my mind or, or anything along those lines, Lord. And let these be your words tonight, God. And, and uh, Father, I pray that you'll open all of our hearts to receive your words, God. And, Father, we need you tonight, Lord. We need your Holy Spirit to sit down with us tonight, God. And, and uh, Father, I need you tonight, Lord. God, I pray that you'll clear my mind and, and help me to think clearly, Lord, and to, and to just say what you would have me to say tonight, Lord. And it's in Jesus' blessed and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so as we dive into um, the book of John here, I want to give you a little bit of, of what's going on. So Jesus, like I said, is in the upper room with his disciples, and he's, he's uh, on the way to the cross, all right? And that's important, okay, because we know that while Jesus is in the last days of his life, all right, the last hours of his life really at this point, okay, he's speaking plainly to his disciples. So he's telling them, that love is important, that love is important, and that's, that's going to be really valuable as we get into this tonight. I just want you to understand that. So my first point tonight is that the carnal world cannot understand true, unconditional agape love. The carnal world cannot understand that. This world that's around us, we can tell them and we can tell them and we can tell them, but they can't understand it because that love only comes from the Father. That type of love, true, unconditional love, only comes from the Father. Look down here. Uh, look with me in verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so as the Father loved Jesus, I have also loved you. Remain in my love. See, we learn that love when we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. When we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we learn what that means to love. Um, there's, this, there's this old Western that I, that I like that... Um, and it's, it's about this family in Virginia during the Civil War, and the, the war has come to their doorstep, all right? And this man is, has already sent off, I think, some of his sons off to war, but he has a daughter there, an a older teenage daughter. And this, this boy that's getting ready to go off to war comes, and he wants to ask this man, this, this farm owner, his, this plantation owner, wants to ask for his daughter's hand in marriage, all right? And the, 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 the dad says, well, do you like her? And the guy replies back, well, I love her. And he says, no, you can't love her yet. You can't love her yet. You don't love her, you know, you don't even understand what that means. Do you like her? And the, and the young man is just insistent that he loves her. But that's the way we are, all right? We think that when, when, as, we, as we grow up in this world, we think that we understand what love is. But we really truly can't understand what love is until... Jesus changes our heart until we accept what Jesus did on the cross and we fully understand the sacrifice that he made, all right? Because when Jesus says here that as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you, well, we have to remember that that love that came from the Father, that love is what sent Jesus to be that sacrifice for us. You know, and Jesus knew that. You know, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's what Jesus is talking about here. He's already said those words chapters ago. All right, and so that's the kind of love in which Jesus came. And he's getting ready to explain that to them, explain that to them again. All right, but that, that love in which Jesus came, okay, you don't understand that until you do the other half of John 3, 16. All right, for God so loved the world that whosoever, that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him. All right, until you accept that, until you have been changed, until you have died to yourself and, 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 and accepted that salvation, until you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, you don't understand that love. All right, and that's the way the world is. And so here in a couple weeks, we're going to have people come in these doors that they have no idea what unconditional love is. All they know is the world's love. All they know is, I love you because, because, I love you if you do something for me, or I love you if you act this way, or I love you because you provide me with security. That's the only type of love that they know. And we start telling them when they walk into these decision rooms, we start telling them about God's love. 
And it's hard sometimes for some of them to understand that God, the maker of this universe, could love them because they've never been loved. And we have to be sensitive to that. This world doesn't understand what unconditional love is. They don't understand that that we can have unconditional love for them as strangers. That we, we could give them, what, I mean, we, we will take care of them. We will love them regardless of what they've done because God loves us. You know, the Bible's clear that we only know love because Christ first loved us. All right, and so, um, so, um, so that's, it, and that also explains if we read down, all right, Jesus in verse 11, he tells us that I've told you these things so that you may be in my joy and that my joy in you, that in, in my, I'm going to start all over again. I've told you these things so that you may, so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. So we see people all around us that have no joy. All right, we see people all around us that have no joy and that's because they don't understand love. They don't understand unconditional love. They don't understand the love from the Father. All right, and they have no joy. They have no true joy in their life. All right, but on the flip side of that, we also have Christians today that are living under that same no joy because they're not doing what Jesus says at the beginning, right? In verse 10, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. All right, remaining in the love of Jesus is what is what keeps a Christian joyous. That's where joy comes from. It's not because of your circumstances, all right? It's walking a righteous life, all right? Not because that's going to get you to heaven, all right? Not because that's going to get you to heaven. That unconditional love is what gets you to heaven. But we have to remain, all right? We have to remain in Jesus' commandments, all right? And if if you're not doing that tonight, if that's where you find yourself, that you say, well, you know, I know that I'm saved, but I have no joy in my life. I know that I'm saved, but I, I feel like I have, I have left that behind, and I have no joy. You need to search your heart tonight, all right? You need to search your heart because Jesus tells us right here in black and white that if we are not keeping his commands, if we are not loving other people, if we are not walking in the Spirit, we will not have joy as a Christian. All right, and that's, um, so we, we, we can put ourselves in that same group as, as these unbelievers if we're not careful. All right, my second point, my second point tonight, and this one, this one is a little bit, a little bit uh, weightier tonight, but um, probably more important, is that love calls us to share the gospel with that lost and dying world. Love is what call, calls us to do that. Love is, is what we should be going out in, all right? And so if we look down here, this is my command that you love one another as I have loved you. No greater love than this is to lay down his life for his friends, all right? No, greater love that, no one has greater love than this than to lay down his life for his friends. See, a couple weeks ago, Brother Keith talked about Ezekiel chapter 33, and the watchman, all right, and, and he related that back to preachers and, and things, and I, I want to take that a step further and just say that we are all watchmen for people that are around us. We all have a responsibility. I want you to turn with me over to the, the book of Joshua in chapter 1, and I want to show you something. I want to show you something, and I felt like this was fitting tonight, um, this was fitting tonight even when, as we're talking about love. Because oftentimes when we think about laying down our life for our friend, all right, um, we, think about it, we think about it as in ending our physical life, right? Like, well, I'll take a bullet for Blake. Blake's a real nice guy. I like him. I love him as a friend. If there was a bullet and I could push him out of the way and take it, I'd take a bullet for him. You know, that's what we think about. That's not necessarily what Jesus was talking about. All right, Jesus had on his mind that he was about to lay down his life, but that's not what he's telling his disciples to do, okay? All right, so uh, look with me in, in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 12. Um, and just a, just a little bit of context here. Um, this, well, I'm going to read it first. Let me read it first. All right, in, in uh, verse 12, Joshua said to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh, 
Remember what Moses, the Lord's servant, commanded you when he said, The Lord your God will give you rest, and he will give you this land. Your wives and your dependents and your livestock may remain in this land that Moses gave you on, the side of, on this side of the Jordan. But your best soldiers, your best soldiers must cross over in battle formation ahead of your brothers and keep them and help them until the Lord gives your brothers rest as he has given you. And they too possess the land that your Lord, Lord your God is giving them. Then you may return to your land and your inheritance and take possession of the land your most your, that Moses, the, the Lord's servant, gave you on the east side of the Jordan. What that's talking about here is we, we all know the story of, of the Hebrew children and how they wandered around in the desert for 40 years because they didn't have faith to cross over the Jordan the first time that God told them to. We know that story. Well, towards the end of that, these three tribes here, or two and a half tribes, when they were waiting and they knew that Moses was getting ready to die, so they knew they were getting ready to cross the Jordan, they said, hey, Moses... We kind of like it right here. This is nice. This is real nice. I mean, we look over there, and that's nice, but this is nice too. And so we want to we have our inheritance here. And so they struck up this deal with God and with Moses, and they made a covenant that if, if God would allow them to have their inheritance on that side of the Jordan, that they would go forward and fight. They would go forward and fight with the other tribes when they crossed the Jordan so that their brothers could get their inheritance, all right? They would, they would leave their families behind, and they would go forth and fight. Well, folks, that's a picture of us today. See, we're just pilgrims here. Our inheritance is in heaven, all right? And we have peace on this earth, just like these tribes had peace, all right, in their inheritance on the other side of the Jordan. But they had to cross over and go, all right? Listen to what it says here, but your best soldiers must cross over in battle formation ahead of your brothers and help them until the Lord gives your brothers rest as he has given you and they possess the land your Lord God has given them. See, just because we're saved, folks, doesn't mean that we're supposed to rest on our laurels. All right? It doesn't mean that we're supposed to just sit down and, and enjoy this life that God has given us. We're supposed to go forth. All right? We're supposed to go after those that are out there in that lost and dying world. It's scary out there. You better be armored up and in battle formation when you go out. That's what the, that's what the, book, of, the book tells us, all right, that we need to go out in battle formation, all right, seeking after those that, that are lost and undone, seeking after those that don't have any peace in their life and telling them about the love of Jesus and telling them about the gospel. That's what we're supposed to do. See, whenever, the, whenever Jesus says here, if you'll look with me in verse 13, whenever Jesus says here, no one has a greater love than this if they lay down their life for their friends. All right? He's not just talking about what he's going to do on the cross. Now, we don't need to forget what Jesus did on the cross. All right? Because Jesus laid down, willingly laid down his life on the cross. You know, you don't hear about him struggling on the cross. You don't hear about him hollering out in pain or, or, or cursing the Roman soldiers as they nailed him to the cross. No. He willingly laid down. See, he could have made that stop. He could have made that stop. And we have to remember that, that that's his love. That's his unconditional love. That's the extent that he went to so that we could have salvation, so that salvation could come to all of mankind. And it's with that same love that he loves those lost people out there. But we are supposed to be his hands and feet and go get them. And in love, that's, that is what we are called to do. All right, and I don't know about y'all, but I fail at that most days. I fail at that. I go through my life and, and you know, I, I try to be as nice to everybody as I can possibly be. But very rarely do I openly tell somebody that, hey, you need Jesus. You need Jesus. Do I, do I do that on a regular basis? Do you do that on a regular basis? When was the last time that you can say to yourself that you directly witnessed to somebody? It's been a long time for me. I mean, I go around and preach, and uh, you know, I, I can be all big and bad when we walk in the jail, and I'll tell them guys they need Jesus all day long, but I don't do it at the gas station. All right, but that's the kind of love that God is talking about here. 
when he tells us to go out and love. All right? Um, so let's look, at, let's look at Matthew chapter 16. All right? Jesus expounds upon this a little bit. In Matthew chapter 16, I marked everything, but I keep not turning to my marks. Um, in Matthew chapter 16, in verse 24, all right, Jesus tells his disciples, okay, he tells his disciples, if anybody wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me, we'll find it. See, Jesus is telling his disciples here that this life on this earth is not worth anything. All right? This life on this earth is, is not worth trying to preserve your reputation. It's not worth trying to preserve your, you know, what, what other people think about you or, or how, how you're seen in the community. That's not what this life is worth. All right? If you try to do that, you will lose your eternity. That's what Jesus is telling his disciples here. All right? And so I, when, as, I was, as I was reading and I was preparing for this, I thought, about, I thought about a time when I was with one of my old friends. All right? Does anybody have old friends? All right? And uh, Kelsey and I had just started going to church here, and, and uh, we were learning and we were growing, and, and, um, and I went and and I'd killed, a, I'd killed a deer. Actually, I think I'd killed two deer. And my friend had killed a deer. And so we all, we got together. There was another guy, another, uh, his wife, actually. So we had four deer we were cutting up in his, in his garage. All right, just having a good time. Okay, cutting up deer. And, and, grind, and we were make, grinding up and making hamburgers and things like that. Well, here comes this dude rolling up in the driveway. All right, a, a Baptist preacher from Marshall County rolled up in the driveway and got out with a track in his hand and walked up to my friend's garage where we're all standing, covered in blood, and he was bold enough to ask if we knew Jesus. Well, my friend turned around with his knife in his hand and ran him off. Not like ran him off, but ran him off. Told him we didn't want to listen to that. And I can remember standing there, that was the last time I ever, I ever hung out with my friend, and I can remember standing there and thinking, and he, he you know, went into a, a, a fit with all sorts of colorful language and called the guy a Bible thumper. And I can remember thinking, I, I'm supposed to be a Bible thumper too. And I didn't say a word. Because I cared about this life on this earth right then more than I cared about my eternity. I didn't love my friend enough to tell him about Jesus. And that's really what it boils down to is how much do you love the people that you are around? Do you love them enough to tell them what they need to know? Do you love them enough to tell them that their sin is sin? You know, if you've got a family member that's, you know, that's, that's living with a woman and got two women on the side, you probably ought to tell them. They shouldn't be doing that. You know, but what do we do? A lot of times we'll send our kids over to their house to play. Because we don't want to hurt their feelings. All right? If we've got a family member that, that you know, we, we, can't, we can't get them up off the couch in the afternoon because they've, they've done drank a, a briefcase full of beer, we probably ought to tell them that Jesus has a better way. We don't want to tell them in, in anger. We don't want to tell them hatefully. But we should tell them that there is a better way, that Jesus loves them. All right, because most of those people are acting that way because they have no joy. See, this ties back into that beginning when Jesus was talking about joy. People act out in their flesh when they're seeking fleshly joy. But we know because we were once just like them. We know that that is never going to fill them up. That's never going to fill up the hole in their heart. But if we don't go out in love and tell them, if we don't do that, then we're failing as Christians. We're failing as Christians. Let's turn back over to our text here. All right. Love calls for us to risk rejection. It calls for us to put ourselves in those awkward situations. All right. It calls for us to love people unconditionally. All right. Can you love somebody enough 
to tell them about Jesus whenever you think that they're going to reject it. You know, I, I think a lot about Clint Reed has, a, has the story about where he went and witnessed to his, I believe it was his uncle or his great uncle. All right, and he starts out that story by saying that he didn't think it was going to do any good, but he felt like he was supposed to do it. That's, that is Christian courage right there. And that is true love. You know, I think about my own grandparents. All of my grandparents have passed away now, and I don't know where any of them are. I have a pretty good idea, and it breaks my heart. Because even though I was a Christian, I never went to them and said, you know, granddad, tell me, tell me your story. Tell me that you are saved. Tell me that you know Jesus. You know, I didn't go to my, I never went to my grandmother and said, and said, you know, when she was in the nursing home and she had all the time in the world on her hands, I never went down and sat with her and asked, tell me, tell me your, your story. Tell me your testimony. That's what true love does, folks. That's what true love does. And I want y'all to think about that. I want y'all to think about that because awkward situations Awkward situations don't seem so awkward when we put them in the light of eternity. Eternity is a long time. You know, when you go in this, in this hell scene over here and you hear Michael cry out, that, that ought to unnerve you there. You know, do you, do you dislike somebody that much that you want to see them live eternity like that? You know, we won't ever see that. Um, but it's a, it's a somber thing to think about. It's a somber thing to think about. We need to call sin, sin. And when we do that, we are truly loving one another. We need to call sin, sin. All right, the last thing that I want you to see tonight is that God will reveal to us where he is working if we are looking and willing to join him in that work. And that will produce eternal fruit. All right, if we do it in love. If we are... are, if we are willing to look for where God is working and we're willing to go out in love and work where God is working, then that will produce eternal fruit. Let's look, at, let's look in verse 15. I do not call you servants anymore because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. I call you friends because I've made, made known to you everything that I've heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you and I appointed you to go and produce fruit and that your fruit should remain, so that whatever you ask in my name, he will give you. See, God has work for each and every one of us to do. God has a place for each and every one of us to go and and, and work to do. He has appointed a time, all right? If you you look over in Ephesians in chapter 2, we hear this all the time. We hear hear Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For you are saved by grace through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift from God, not from works, so that no one can boast. But we so often leave out verse 10. We leave out verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared ahead of time for us to do. See, God has laid out for you things to do. But when you're not living in his love, when you're not, when you're not following his commands and living in his love and abiding in his joy... You can't see those things. You, can't, you won't feel that tug on your heart to go and talk to that coworker. You won't feel that tug on your heart to, to ask the lady at the drive through how she's doing. You won't feel that tug on your heart. All right, And that's, that's a bad place to be in as a Christian. That's a bad place to be in as a Christian. See, God has work for you to do. He has people for you to witness to. He has fellow believers for you to disciple. So we haven't even talked about brotherly love. We do that really good as a church. I don't know about y'all, but I feel loved all the time. All right? But we need to take that love, and over the, over, over the course of time, we need to go out as well. All right? But, but uh, God has fellow disciples for you, fellow believers for you to disciple. God has a world of people For you to shine the light of Christ on. All right? But you have to decide what you're going to do with that unconditional love. That's a decision that each and every Christian has to make. 
each and every day when we get up. You know, in that passage in Matthew tells us that every day when we get up, we have to deny ourselves, we have to lay aside ourselves and our own desires, we have to pick up our cross, and we have to follow him each and every day. It's a daily thing. All right. After we do all that, after we lay all that stuff aside, all right, then we then we start thinking about things like like in Ephesians where it tells us to put on the armor of God. See, all of this ties together. All of this ties together about getting ready for battle. All right, to go out because there is a spiritual battle out there in the world. All right, Satan is battling for the souls of the lost. That's that's his main agenda is to keep lost people lost. See, he's already lost you. If you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he's lost you. So all he can do now is keep you from bringing other people. And that's his goal. It's to keep you from being effective. All right? And we have to counteract that with love. By sharing the unconditional love of Jesus with everybody that we come in contact with. All right? By sharing the love of Jesus with everybody that we come in contact with. All right, so in closing tonight, I just want to share, you one, I want to share with you one more thing. Um, I, was listening to, I was listening to a message this week about prayer. Uh, a, it was a, it was a on the phone thing. Um, little purple icon, podcast. All right, um, I was listening to a podcast this week about prayer. And the gentleman made a really good point that I think really applies to us and, and really ties into ties into what we talked about tonight as we get ready for judgment house i know that we all know people that we that we want to bring we want to we want to bring to judgment house we want to see them get saved we all know people like that and i want to encourage you i want to encourage you to make yourself a list because this man said something that I, i had never really thought about before an unnamed burden is no burden at all An unnamed burden is no burden at all. So I encourage you to make a list of people that you want to invite to Judgment House. Sit down and prayerfully ask God to give you the wisdom, the wisdom for the people that you need to reach out to, the people that you need in your sphere of influence, the people that that you can show that unconditional love with, the people that you probably already have been for years sharing that unconditional love with, all right? And I want you to prayerfully make yourself a list and and pray for those people over the next month. I want to challenge each and every one of you to do that. All right? I know that we say that we're full, all right? But we're not full. We always got room for one more. All right? We always got room for a family. We've always got room. We can stay late. All right? I'm sure Chris ain't in here, but Leanne, don't shoot me. We could probably even add days if we have to. All right? We say all the time, if one person gets saved, it will all be worth it. If one person gets saved, if one soul is headed to eternity, it's all worth it. All right? And that could be because of your prayers. That could be because you took the time to pray for that person and work up the courage to give them a flyer. I know some of y'all don't have any problems handing out flyers left and right or telling people they need to come to Jesus, but for some people, that's a big step to give somebody a flyer and say, I want you to come and, and, and go through this with me, or I, I would like for you to come and see this, this play that's going on at our church. All right, that's a big step. But I want, you to, I want to encourage you to do that, that an unnamed burden is no burden at all. All right, and we truly don't love people until we're burdened for them. Until we're burdened for the lost, that's when you truly learn to love people. All right, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for tonight, Lord. God, we thank you. I want to thank you for your love, Lord. God, I want to thank you for your mercy and your grace, God. But I want to thank you most of all for the love in which you sent Jesus in, Lord.